Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our COE seminar this morning. Uh, we have the honor of having Dr. Oliver Sarter here to talk to us this morning. Dr. Sarter is, received his training at Tulane University, um, then followed up with fellowships um, at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, Tulane University, and the National Institutes of, of Health. He's had academic appointments over his career at the National Cancer Institute, Louisiana State University, the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, and now currently is at Tulane University where he's the medical director of the Tulane Cancer Center. He also holds the CE and Bernadine Labor Professor of Cancer Research and is the Associate Dean of for Oncology at Tulane University School of Medicine. Over his career, he's published over 400 peer-reviewed papers and also notably has led five phase three clinical trials, which has led to new FDA approvals for treatment for prostate cancer. And today he's going to talk to us about one of the areas of his research, looking at survival of African American men after cipulosal T immunotherapy. And with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Sarter. Great, thank you very much. And um, you know, this is um, a, a little slice of what I do, but I think it's an interesting slice. So I'll present the data, and uh, I, I think you'll be impressed by the data. But at the same time, I think we have. Uh, a lot of questions about the etiology, the pathophysiology, underlying mechanisms, and, and that's where I think we all need help in being able to move forward. Um, I, I have a feeling that a lot of people may not be very familiar with simple cell T, so I wanted to give a little bit of background. Uh, it is a, it's an immunotherapy, but a very particular type of immunotherapy. Uh, the genesis for the thinking actually goes back a very, very long time. Um, Dr. Dranoff uh, up in Boston, who uh, was able to transduce a variety of prostate cancer cells and then was looking at the anti-tumor immunity that was, was result after this transduction. And uh, what, what he did is to take a variety of cytokines and, and then look at these tumor-free animals over time and uh, it was a little bit interesting that the GMCSFs seem to have a very distinct effect as compared to other cytokines, uh, although IL-3, IL-4, IL-6 were obviously uh, of, of some interest as well. Um, and this got people thinking about GMCSF relatively early, and there were a series of clinical trials and experiments. And actually, GMCSF alone as a monotherapy may actually um, decrease the rate at which PSA rises. So there's something about GMCSF that might be a little bit different than some of the other cytokines that we're pretty familiar with. So uh, a, a little tiny startup company got, got the idea that uh, what they really needed to do was to make a fusion protein that would have a prostatic acid phosphatase, which of course is, is derived uh, essentially exclusively from prostate cancer, and fuse it with the GMCSF, and then use this fusion protein to stimulate antigen presenting cells. And, and so that's what they did. They put together this fusion protein and developed a, a way of, of immunizing cells in an ex vivo setting in the following manner. So first of all, the, the patient comes in and they're leukopheresis. So you remove a substantial number of white cells and then you isolate uh, through uh, a variety of ways the energy presenting cells. And then you add in this prostatic acid phosphatase, GMCSF, uh, antigen cytokine combo. And then you uh, put it in a little witch's brew for a bed and then you let the cells mature a little bit and then you give these antigen loaded antigen presenting cells back to the patient and that is simple cell t and you, you do it uh typically for three times um a couple of weeks apart and so what what happens in this trial that was called d9901 of the impact trial is that men with asymptomatic or relatively minimally symptomatic 
uh, antigen independent prostate cancer in the nomenclature of the day. We would call that metastatic CRPC today. We'll randomize to uh, a placebo, but, but actually it wasn't really a placebo. What it was is were these antigen presenting cells that had not been stimulated with GM CSF. So it's a pretty good, pretty good control group. And then they would be given um, the simple cell teeth, a two to one ratio in, in the quote active treatment arm, and then follow for progression. And then there was a salvage opportunity after progression. And what basically was, was demonstrated is that there was a survival benefit, overall survival benefit is published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And uh, this was despite some, some crossover. Uh, this was the, the primary efficacy endpoint being overall survival and, and an intention to treat analysis. And, and what you've got is the, is the uh, outcomes, which really are, are strikingly positive and led to an FDA approval. Um, so that is, um, I think, pretty important work and practice changing. And this came in um, FDA approval from 2000, 2010. Now, what, one of the things that, that, that was interested here is that there was a substantial difference in the median survival by baseline PSA. And that's not necessarily too surprising because PSA is a prognostic marker. Uh, but what was interesting and surprising is that the hazard ratio was quite variable and much improved in those with the lowest PSA quartile. So they divided this Paul Shellhammer, who was uh, AUA president and uh, were very involved with the trial. Uh, they looked at quartiles, and these were 22.1 or less than 22.1, 22 to 50, 50 to 134, greater than 134. And you can see that the patients were uh, evenly distributed, as you expect in a quartile analysis. And here you see the median overall survival running from 41 to 27 to 20.4 and 18.4. And again, that sort of emphasizes the fact that there is a prognostic importance to PSA. And here's the control group, but here's the difference and here's the hazard ratio. And, and what you can see is that for the lowest quartile, the hazard ratio for the treated patients is actually down to be 0.51. And yes, there, there was a, a, a trend in all the quartiles, um, but you can see that the confidence intervals clearly overlap one in part due to the small size of the sample. But what you see here is that the effectiveness of the simple cell T appears to be preferentially seen within those individuals who have the lowest PSA. Um, and perhaps that could be expected from some type of immunotherapy like this, where the immune system has uh, an opportunity to perhaps make a larger impact among those individuals who have a little more time to live. Um, that's speculation, we don't know exactly why, but there is a large hazard ratio of the differences. So um, here I'm gonna be presenting um, this data. We published it a little bit earlier this year. It was a, it was a, a group of investigators who contributed uh, uh, to this, uh, Tiagano, who many of you might um, uh, know up at University of Washington in Seattle, uh, Andy Armstrong uh, and, and I were the co-leads, Andy from, from Duke. Um, and a variety of other investigators, many of whom are fairly well known in the field, including Paul Shellhammer and Elizabeth Heath and more. So uh, what, what we basically um, wanted to do was to look at this African-American question within the context of a registry. And so what I'm gonna be presenting here is not a controlled clinical trial. It, it is a, uh, a registry that was conducted as a request from the FDA to gather more information about potential toxicities. And I'll go into that in just a moment. But one of the things that we all know, and, and, and I think this is a bit of a truism, is that African-American men often present with uh, aggressive prostate cancer. There's a higher incidence of prostate cancer in African-Americans. There's a greater risk of disease progression after local therapy. There's increased prostate cancer mortality 
um, unequivocal over twofold, if you work on a population type basis. And it's sort of interesting that despite this sort of uh, unequivocal higher mortality rate, there actually is a little bit of data when we set out to do this analysis. Uh, there, there was a phase three CRP, metastatic CRPC docetaxel series of trials, which showed a small one month overall survival advantage for African Americans in a multivariate analysis. That, that was from Susan Hallaby, uh, excellent, excellent statistician, and uh, practicing at Duke and was with CLGB. So uh, that, that's sort of a little bit of background, but there had been an extremely small subset, and I, I think it was, it was under 20 patients, where all the phase three simple cell T trials were sort of combined uh, to look at African Americans, and, and there actually was a small difference um, in the African American patients. It was really hypothesis generating. I don't think any, anybody would have said it was definitive. Um, Dave McLeod presented this in abstract form back in 2012. Uh, actually, I was part of uh, the spurring on for that analysis because there was even some data back then that I thought could make the hypothesis about African Americans interesting in, um, in uh, immunotherapy. Uh, but the bottom line is, th this was sort of the, the background that we had when we undertook these analysis. So the uh, simple cell T registry that I'll be discussing here. Uh, is actually a fairly large, what I'll call real world experience. Uh, because these are patients treated predominantly in community ca cancer centers and urology offices across the nation. Uh, they were just using simple cell T in, a, in an FDA approved format. Uh, there, th these were individuals who had a uh, insurance payment for the, um, for the treatment. And it is the largest single real world experience with, with simple cell T. Um, and it was all, all the data was collected uh, prospectively. Uh, it was decided what we were gonna measure from the very beginning. And uh, we did so, and there are a series of, of publications from, from this registry, uh, one of the important ones uh, here. Now, African-American men were 12% of the study population. Um, which is not bad, much higher than what you see in a typical prospective randomized clinical trial, uh, I might add, but it's not a huge number, but nevertheless, we, we had enough to, to be able to work with because we had 1,900 patients in the beginning. And th there were a couple of ways that we did, that did this, and I'm, I'm gonna tell you that we did all comers, um, but, but there were some, some issues around baseline matching uh, that could be perceived as problematic. So what we did, given the importance of PSA in the simple cell T uh, effectiveness, as seen from the Shellhammer paper and, and others actually, we did a two to one matching based on baseline PSA and brought it in within about 10%. And so for, for all the African-Americans, we ended up excluding two, I'll show you here in a second. Uh, we had uh, two Caucasians with, with a similar PSA. And, you know, the one endpoint that is absolutely clear, the one that we can measure where there's no controversy is overall survival. And we, we had overall survival in a, in, a, in a nice mature fashion. And then from there, we did detailed integrated multivariate analyses. So that's kind of the setup for, for where, we, where we started in the facility registry. Now, here's a consort diagram. Um, starting out with that 1,902 patients, we excluded those uh, who were neither Caucasian nor African Americans, and you know had some uh, some Asians, uh, Native Hawaiians, uh, American Indians, etc. Um, that were taken out of the analysis, leaving us with about uh, 1,870. And then we took the two groups and. We excluded just a, 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 a few of the African Americans, just two. We had one individual that did not have a baseline PSA, so we couldn't do much with that. And we had another guy who had an extremely high PSA that we just couldn't find a match for, um, and then put together the Caucasian matching. So we ended up uh, in this matched analysis of 438 Caucasians, 219. 
African Americans. And so that's that's that was kind of our starting point. Again, I'm going to emphasize. I'm going to come back and we'll talk about the entire population. And it turns out that in the multivariate analysis, we get similar results. Um, but this is the analysis that that we had prospectively decided uh, to do, uh, taking a, in this match pair analysis. Now, a, in order to begin to a consider, remember we just matched on the PSA. We wanted to see, well, well hey, how did the rest of it look? And uh, the median age was 71. Uh, ECOG performance status was zero in the majority of patients. Gleason uh, was eight or higher and, and almost half and pretty well matched between the two populations. Uh, the median PSA, 28.7, 32.9, you know, quite closely matched, as you'd expect. Median hemoglobin, um, essentially the same, 12.9, 2.1, 12.1. Uh, alkaline phosphatase, uh, similar LDH, uh, visceral lymph node disease, and, and these are things that we know that are potential prognostic importance. Uh, local therapy, a vast majority of the men have been previously treated with some type of local therapy, the radical prostatectomy or, or radiation. And, and a, a little bit of imbalance here with the chemotherapy. We see on the Caucasians, it was about 17.6% had prior to syntaxel. Uh, as opposed to 10% on the African Americans, and then prior abiraterone or enzalutamide. Uh, and and it, when this was put into force, uh, we didn't have a lot of Abbey and Enzo treated patients, but, and that's why you see this relatively low percentage as prior treatments. But again, you're going to look at these and say, okay, pretty reasonably balanced. So here's kind of the, the, the bottom line that you know, came out, I think, loud and clear. Uh, this is just putting these, these two together, and uh, the median overall survival in the African Americans was 35.3 months, and Caucasians, it was 25.8. By the way, in the, in the prospective randomized phase three trial published in the New England Journal, uh, it, it was right around 25 months, so the Caucasian population performed exactly as expected. Uh, but the unexpected finding was the African American population doing better, and it was, you know, it was it was a pretty considerable amount better. It was 9.5 months better, which is is quite striking in a population of this size. Um, has ratio 0.7, confidence intervals from 0.57, 0.86, p value less than 0.001. Uh, so this this was a pretty striking finding. Uh, and just sort of our top line results, if you will. Now, uh, the next thing is we wanted to look by these quartiles. And the quartiles are a little bit different here because the, the median PSA was lower. The median PSA was about 29.4. And so you've got a, a, a lower PSA on median than you would have had in the phase three as published in, in New England Journal. Um, but nevertheless, what you, what you see here is the distinction between the African Americans and Caucasians. And uh, these, were, these were really, I don't know if you can see the point, or hopefully you can, and, and the first quartile was 54 months median survival. Now re remember, these are low PSAs, but nevertheless, that's a really, really good survival. Uh, the difference was 16.9 months, Caucasians were 37.4. The hazard ratio was 0 0.49. Again, with a, a pretty surprising and strong effect, particularly noted among those individuals with the lowest PSA. Now, we looked at the second quartile, and here the hazard ratio was almost the same at 0 0.54. And you can see the confidence intervals, 0 0.35 to 0 0.85. Obviously, these first two quartiles are significant, despite the fact that they're relatively underpowered analyses. Uh, so this is, again, sort of compatible with the Shellhammer data that what we're seeing in this uh, effect is that those people with the lowest PSAs seem to survive longer. Yes, prognostic, and that part we get. Uh, not, not a surprise, but the surprise was that these hazard ratios were so strong in the context of having a relatively low PSA with the African Americans having very substantial benefits, 16.9, 17.9. As you get to the higher PSAs, you can see 
these hazard ratios go up to 0 0.92 and no, no statistical significance. But nevertheless, we found this uh, to be interesting. Now, this is just uh, above and below the median. Um, you know, it's not uh, any, it's just sort of compilating those, those two uh, lower quartiles and just showing you uh, the differences. The hedge rate says 0 0.52. Uh, median African American survival 54.3 versus 33.4, uh, quite strong. Above the median, not really a lot of difference. Hazard rates is 0 0.86, you certainly can't say it's any different. Um, and so this does seem to be a preferential effect within those individuals with a lower PSA. Uh, but again, the preferential effect that was seen in the uh, phase three trial with the placebo versus simple cell T was again that those with lower PSA had the most effect. But well, that's a quite striking difference when it comes to the median, uh, the median differences. So th the next thing we, we wanted to do was, was to do a, a detailed analysis for prognosis. Okay, what were the prognostic variables? And basically we, we gathered up uh, essentially all of the prognostic variables that, that have been in the literature and ran this in our analysis. Now here, we're not putting rates, we're just, we're just saying, okay, what is out there in the univariate analysis? What is important for prognosis? Well, um, it, it turns out that, that age is important, uh, ECOG performance status is important, uh, baseline PSA, very important. Uh, here, the hazard ratio is actually 2.1 for greater than median, and that, if we look up and down at our hazard ratios, the 2.1 is actually the single largest hazard ratio, meaning in univariate analysis, uh, this, is, this is quite important. Um, baseline LDH, didn't have it in everybody, but we had it in a number of patients. Alconfostatase greater than median. Uh, hemoglobin less than median, bone metastases, yes or no, uh, number of bone metastases, a Gleason score um, was not significant, but that's really, I think, because all of these individuals have metastatic disease, and once you have metastases, Gleason is a little less important. Um, here in the univariate analysis, the uh, Caucasians versus African Americans, higher uh, has ratio here for Caucasians, meaning, um, you know, higher risk of death among those who are Caucasians. Um, body weight, uh, practice type didn't make any difference. Lymph node metastasis only uh, did uh, make a difference. You have lymph nodes only, you have a better prognostic uh, outcome, and we've known this from other studies. Visceral mets, we hardly had any visceral mets, so this is underpowered analysis. Uh, radical prostatectomy, yes versus no, and uh, if you did have a radical, you had a better prognosis. Again, this confirms other studies and probably a difference between the de novo presenting patients and the recurrent patients. Um, external beam, uh, radiotherapy, brachytherapy, yes, no, really didn't make a lot of difference. Uh, and the prior local therapy, this was driven in part by, by the radiotherapy. Uh, prior dose of taxol, yes or no, did make a difference. Prior abiraterone, yes or no, did make a difference. It's underpowered. But you can see that there's a lot of different variables that go into the prognosis of these patients. And we, we did a pretty careful analysis here. But now, now we come to the, the multivariate. And uh, again, you know, pay attention to the hazard ratios as you go up and down. You can kind of see... Um, you know, those things are important. Uh, age continues to be important. Body weight falls out. Uh, ethnicity stays in at 1.67. And by the way, we essentially put all the things in, in the first analysis into the second, and this is what came out. The ECOG performance status, not surprising. Baseline, median PSA, 1.74. Again, a powerful predictor. Uh, Alkaline phosphatase, 1.59. Hemoglobin, yes. Lymph node metastases only, yes. Uh, prior prostatectomy, just missing 0 0.0557. Uh, prior Abby ends up prior dostaxel. So again, we come out with the concept that the African American men are doing better or Caucasians are doing worse, whichever you prefer to, to, to point out. But this is in the multivariate analysis. Now, one of the things that could potentially be an explanation is differences 
And the lifelong therapies have been given after sickle cell T. And because this is a prospective registry and we asked that these data be collected, we, we actually had uh, quite good data on the post sickle cell T therapies. And it's typically given relatively early. And uh, you, you can see that um, only um, a few of the patients had no uh, interventions uh, here, uh, about a quarter in each case. Uh, the median number of therapies were given 1.6, uh, excuse me, the mean. Uh, the median was actually a little bit higher, but I think this is, this is just uh, slightly different. But if anything, there's more treatments after simple cell T, if anything, in the Caucasians, which presumably should be more favorable. Abiraterone about the same, enzalutamide about the same, cabazitaxel maybe a little bit higher um, in, in the Caucasians, radium just a small percentage, and dostaxel. So anyway, I, I don't think that the post-treatment, post-simple cell T therapies can explain what we have observed here. Um, at least I certainly could not be convinced. So now, now we begin to ask, okay, so if this is true, you know, why are patients living longer? And, and of course, unfortunately, I'm going to have to speculate. We, despite my uh, attempts, uh, the, the, the banking of specimens from this registry was done only in a very small subset. And it's extremely frustrating because it's a relatively small biotech company. They didn't want to be um, financing an operation that was beyond their their capacity. And by the way, this is a very common thing. If 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 you work with small biotechs, you often know that you're working as best you can. You may not be working optimally, um, but I, I think if we take these, uh, th this information. Oh, and by the way, I should have said, we put everything into the multivariate analysis, not looking at the PSA match, looking at, at all the patients. And we still come up with African-Americans doing better, despite some rather substantial imbalances in some of the baseline factors. Why? Is this due to change in the tumor? Is it immunology? Is it both? You know, I don't really know. Uh, I don't think any of us really know. Um, this was one thing that had caught my eye. This is from Cell back in 2016, looking at genetic ancestry and population differences in immune responses. And there are uh, a couple of conclusions that they make is that differences in the transcriptional response to infection in humans are under strong genetic influence dictated by their ancestry and, and also potentially some recent uh, natural selection events. Um, and they, they unequivocally note, and remember this is not to tumors, uh, this is to the various uh, uh, pathogens, particularly those that are bacterial pathogens where they have the, these good data sets, that African-American ancestry is associated with a stronger inflammatory response. And they uh, showed this in a very convincing manner. Obviously, you don't get to publish in cell without having strong and convincing as well as novel data. And uh, this, this would indicate that immune responsiveness in African Americans is not the same as it is in those from European ancestry. And potentially, this could be important. And in a little twist here, there was also a potential Neanderthal uh, influence, um, which it was a relatively small set of genes, but potentially even could be important. So uh, we, we all have a, not all of us, but many of us have a bit of Neanderthal ancestry as well. And that might have played uh, a small role. And that uh, is, of course, a little bit conjectural. Now, the, there's more recent data. This is a brand new October 9, 2020 clinical cancer research. And uh, the African-American prostate tumors have significant enrichment of various immuno-oncologic pathways, including the pro-inflammatory cytokines. So again, this sort of says that maybe African-Americans are having a more robust immune response. And they, uh, they were looked at interferon alpha, interferon gamma, TNF alpha signaling, interleukins, uh, uh, EMT, and which is a epithelial mosaical transformation, and which may or may not be related to 
the inflammatory cytokine environment, but African-Americans had a higher total in the incontent scores compared to Europeans, and uh, the p-value is significant. So both of these data, and much more, by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm just scraping the, uh, the, the very top of the pyramid, uh, there's a substantial amount of data that would suggest that African-American immune systems are not the same as those of Europeans, and characteristically, there is a more robust response in, in African Americans. This may be related to COVID and all sorts of other things where uh, a robust immune response, of course, is not always favorable, although uh, many times it is, and perhaps in our studies is favorable. Now, what about the, um, the tumors? So uh, this was a, a cancer research publication a couple of years ago that, that caught my the published uh, by Vanessa Hayes and her group uh, out of Australia, and she's from South Africa, and looked at South African um, Af uh, South African blacks, not African Americans, but South Africans versus European derived tumors, and she actually made the conclusion that there were small somatic variants that were significantly higher and that she noted an elevated tumor mutational burden and also some differences in the driver mutations. So this could be very provocative, sort of suggesting that uh, you can have higher tumor mutational burden in, in African, uh, and these are Africans opposed to African Americans, and yes, there can be some potential differences through admixture, but that was not uh, carefully studied. But then here we have this uh, quite recent study and this is also from 2020, looking at genomic profiling of prostate cancer tumors. And what, what you can see here is that in this large prostate cancer cohort, um, that the frequency of alterations were relatively similar and their tumor mutational burden was similar. So we have some discordant data when it comes to TMB, uh, but nevertheless, I think there are differences and African-American tumors that, that are likely real. So when we, when we look at the, the conclusions, I think from our, our analyses, African-American men had longer survival than Caucasian men post simple cell T in these analyses. I, I, I really think that it's, it's quite clear. Uh, we've looked at it in multivariate analysis. We've looked at it uh, by quartile analysis, we've looked at it in a, in a variety of different ways, and, and the data are very, very, very consistent in the largest database for simple cell T that will ever be available. So the magnitude of the benefit, I think, was surprisingly high. The median benefit was 9.5 months. And there have been some previously reported CRPC subsets. I mentioned docetaxel, also a little bit with radium. That would be a little bit higher. Uh, but nothing of this magnitude. This this is a magnitude that that is not been seen in any other of the CRPC studies. I, I think you know perhaps we can implicate both immune responsiveness and tumor characteristics, um, but I think that's still a little bit conjectural. Uh, I'm going to say that clearly more research is needed to understand the etiology uh, of these findings, and 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 my hope. Uh, we're going to be spurring on the African-American uh, research that'll look at the differences between tumors, perhaps with a new light, perhaps with a particular attention toward immune responsiveness. And one of the pieces of good news is, I, I think, with all the dismal news regarding African-Americans in general in prostate cancer, this is a highlight. This is a positive finding and a positive study and it would suggest that there is something that we can do in the FDA-approved armamentarium that can improve outcomes for African-American men with CRPC. And that uh, concludes my formal presentation. We'll spend the rest of the time in Q&A or however it is that we, we want to take it. And I think I'm going to stop the sharing of the screen. Um, and uh, Jenny, I don't know if you're the uh, the 
seminar organizer or how do we how do we proceed from here so, so uh this is nick and we do actually have a raised hand here by dr ryan and i'll go ahead and allow him to talk to begin with a uh, reminder to folks though that there are two ways to ask questions you can use the raise hand feature to ask your question verbally or you can type your question into the q a module and we'll we'll read it aloud so uh without further ado here is dr ryan oliver chuck good to see you welcome to minnesota uh, the other end of the Mississippi, right? I uh, wish we could have you here in person, and it's a great talk, and it's a really important topic. You know, um, one of the things that's been struck was another striking finding was Brandon Mahal's letter in the New England Journal of Medicine a few weeks uh -huh. ago, which looked at the genomic profiles of the tumors of African Americans, Caucasians, and Asians, uh, which is interesting, uh, and they showed very different uh, genomic profiles uh, of the of tumors. Uh, essentially, in that in that group, the African Americans had more targetable mutations and they just had different profiles of different you know mutations they had higher uh, less tp53 alterations more braf alterations and more androgen receptor alterations and i know you don't i don't know if you have that in your registry if you're going to be doing tumor sequencing or not obviously it's not available from uh, impact but i just wonder what your thoughts are on how the tumor genomics may actually um, be driving some of this yeah, I saw that. And by the way, as a as a difference in some of the in some of the CDK 12s as well. So, uh, yeah, Brandon Brandon actually is a is an old uh, friend and colleague. We published together uh, a bit, and uh, when I saw that letter, I was thinking, "Gosh, why did why is that a letter to the New England Journal?" Right, exactly. And, and then and then I think he chose impact and and a little bit of brevity just to be able to drive the point home. Right. But that 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 figure is really quite striking. For those who are not familiar with it, it's a, it's a great little segue. But what that does do, Chuck, is underscore the fact that there are some genomic alterations that are a little bit distinct. And I think we have a lot more to learn about the African-American tumors. There's, there's a relatively limited analysis, and I'm going to emphasize that what was studied in that particular Brandon Mahal um, study was predominantly the genes that we know a fair amount about. But there's so much more to understand about it. You know, let's just talk, for instance, about the enhancer upstream of AR. And mm -hmm. we do believe that there is some alteration in the, in the uh, AR-driven uh, genes and the AR receptor, but there's all this dark matter out there, the non-coding um, DNA, uh, that of course is involved with the regulatory control that I think we need to explore. So the bottom line is there are differences there, they're important, but there's so much more to learn. And I think hopefully the people on this call are gonna contribute. There's also pretty significant differences in androgen metabolism uh, and uh, the, the variance around um, uh, androgen breakdown and perhaps ligand availability between uh, races, and that's also being studied. So somehow these things must interact. Obviously. Yeah, and uh, Chuck, are you familiar with the Abbey Race study? Um, yep. Um, yep. Yep. And and so I'm going to give the the shout out to to Dan George and the guys at Duke for putting it together, looking at Abiraterone. Of course, Chuck helped to lead the uh, the huge Cougar 302 trial, which is practice changing, but it was a similar prospective analyses of African-Americans and Caucasians. And it turns out that the time to PSA progression um, is, is actually better in African-Americans. Uh, but I don't know if you've seen the punchline is the RPFS is not. Mm. And what that means is a little bit, it's a little bit interesting. The time from PSA progression to radiographic progression in African-Americans is almost one-to-one. -one. Whereas in Caucasians, PSA progression will precede the RPFS. So there's some interesting things that that uh, is about to be submitted right now. We have a uh, question from Dr. Dame, and he's uh, raised his hand and is able to talk. Take it away, Dr. Dame. Hey, Oliver, how are you doing? Great, great talk. I you partially answered my my question. I was going to ask whether any uh, racial subset analysis has been performed on response to therapies other than Cell T. And so you indicated there has been some subset analysis for abiraterone at Duke. What about enzalutamide? You know, I haven't seen with, uh, with enzalutamide. In the prospective randomized trials, there are very few 
uh, African Americans, Indians, Little Mont so it was a, it was fairly international. And when within the international subsets, of course, you don't get the African Americans. But in addition to that, uh, the enrollment was was relatively low. Uh, the ones we've we've looked at, and I'm, uh, again, a shout out to Susan Hallaby at Duke for for the dose of taxa work. Um, there, there is a better outcome with metastatic CRPC with docetaxel is radium work. Uh, and then there's the, the abiraterone is, is still a bit of an evolving picture. But the cool thing about the Abbey race trial was a prospective randomized trial with uh, a direct comparison between the African-Americans and the Caucasians. And, and, and that has really been unprecedented. And, and there's another trial now that the Duke has put together. Uh, to examine more questions about the antigen receptor. Um, Scott, let me ask you, because a uh, few people know the antigen receptor better than you. Have you looked at the African-American subsets? Do you find uh, differential activity? We, we found a little bit in the CTDNA, I might add, we published in an abstract form, that the AR abnormalities may be a little more common in African-Americans. But I, I, I'd love to hear about what you've done and your perspective. Yeah, so we've really relied on a lot of the publicly available RNA-seq and DNA-seq databases, which are predominantly Caucasian American men. So, so we have not been able to look at anything powered appropriately to look for any racial or ethnic differences. I think it's an area that could be interesting. If, if I wanted to make a conjectural statement, and obviously conjectural, I, I would say that there is likely more androgen receptor driven effects in African Americans as opposed to Caucasians. Now, that's a speculative statement, but I, I'm putting together the tea leaves that I've gathered from a number of other things, and in part, it, it may be you know one of the one of the driving parts of my own thinking is these androgen receptor mutations might be a little more frequent and African-Americans at the time of progression. Uh, and if they're pathogenic or important mutations, maybe they're functioning as drivers. But there's so much more we have to learn here. Absolutely, I agree. We do have some typed questions as well. Uh, Dr. Sutter, if you wanted to open up the Q&A module, um, I, I could sure. certainly field them, but if you wanted to read them aloud, if you see them there. One from Dr. Yi. Yep. Uh, Hey, Doug, yeah, is this finding generalized to other immunotherapies approved for GU tumors in African American, both men and women? And the answer is, I, I don't know. Uh, you know, these, these other immunotherapies, of course, are approved throughout the spectrum of cancers, not just GU cancers, and uh, the PD1, PDL1 uh, antagonists. Uh, we, we actually have put together a prospective trial with a, a PDL1 antagonist and are attempting to look at African Americans in a prospective manner. Um, at, the, at the same time, I think this needs to be done more generally. I, 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 have, I, I don't know if this is a broad phenomenon, if it's only related to prostate cancer, if it's related to a variety of other immunotherapies. There's so many exploratory questions that one could ask. Um, and I, I'll, I'll simply say, and Doug would probably know a lot better than I would on this, but on the triple negative breast cancer, uh, which is predominant in African Americans, I, I believe that immunotherapy is now uh, approved. Is that is that right, Doug? Yeah, I unmuted myself. It's a it's before the FDA now. Um, pembrolizumab in combination, both in uh, adjuvant and metastatic settings, are in front of the FDA. So we'll we'll find out soon, but. Uh, Oliver, as long as I have the microphone at the moment, can I ask you sort of another question? So sure. as long as you bring up triple negative breast cancer, there's a, a little bit of data in African-American women that site of ancestry from Africa makes a difference as well. East Africa, West Africa, uh, there are some differences. So I don't know if you've been able to parse that finally down into your African-American database. Do you think site of ancestry in Africa makes, uh, uh, changes things? No, but you, you raise a really good point. We, we've not been able to do any of those breakdowns, but what, what I'll say is that Africa is a big continent. 
and sub-Saharan Africa is a really big continent. If you, you go to South Africa, there are many, many different groups within the nation that we call South Africa. And the same is going to be true for whether it's Botswana, Zimbabwe, or Western Africa, where a lot of distinctions occur. We speak about African Americans as though they're a monolith, and they're not. Uh, so your point is very well taken, but unfortunately, I'm not able to give any insights. So we do have another type of question, I believe from Dr. Simmons, Glenn Simmons. Yeah. Have any breakdowns been done on regional differences in African Americans or African borns in U.S. or other locations globally? Yeah, great question and, and sort of a, a, a subset of, of what Doug asked. The answer is no. Um, we, we've not really looked at this. Now, the, you know, they're admixture studies, and, and these, these have been performed. And by the way, uh, in a very clever use of the admixture studies, uh, I, I don't know if you're familiar with Matthew Friedman's discovery of the 8Q24 risk SNP. And 8Q24 has some non coding regions that predispose both to prostate cancer and other cancers. And he discovered it by using admixture studies to trace the cancer risk. And it was started out with African American linkage. So there, there's, there's a whole wide variety of, of clever genetics that can be looked at. Um, and when we begin to define regional differences, it may be genetic differences that we parse out in more detail. Uh, but in terms of the simple cell T or the immunotherapy, the answer is I haven't seen anything that uh, I would want to comment on. All right. Well, uh, we really appreciate your talk. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Glad to be here. And uh, thanks for tuning in, particularly uh, Doug and Scott and Chuck. Um, I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person, but maybe we'll do that another day. Thanks, Oliver. Great to okay. see you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thanks so much. Everyone have a good day. Bye.